the previous case, a positive feedback mechanism was introduced. Positive feedback is a non-homeostatic mechanism that destabilizes changes through amplifying signals in the same direction of the original stimulus, accelerating transitions between states. Catherine is having a baby, and she is undergoing labor. The baby's head begins to push through the cervix, resulting in increased pressure on it. This stimulates some cells known as receptor cells, causing them to transfer chemical signals to the brain which in return secretes oxytocin. Oxytocin diffuses to the cervix via the blood, leading to more uterine contractions and thus, of course, more pain. Heightened release of oxytocin increases cervical contractions, accelerating the process of delivery. Stretching of the cervix sends signals to the body of the uterus through the uterine muscles, resulting in contractions. These contractions stretch the cervix even more, causing relatively more powerful contractions. When this process becomes powerful enough, a baby is born. Congratulations! A positive feedback loop occurs to control the infrequent events. It moves the system further away from the target of equilibrium by amplifying the effects of an event. It occurs when immediate action is necessary. Action potential is a sudden, fast, momentary, and propagating electric change in resting membrane potential of excitable tissue to respond to threshold stimulus. It is caused by the change in membrane permeability to sodium ions and potassium ions through the opening of voltage gated ion channels. Action potential goes through several phases, starting with the adequate stimulus. If the stimulus doesn't reach the threshold, then it's considered a failed initiation. Then depolarization until it reaches the overshoot phase, repolarization and after hyperpolarization, ending when it again reaches its resting membrane potential. Action potential is a self propagating mechanism. In other words, the change in polarity in one part of an excitable tissue stimulates another part to depolarize as well. This sequence continues until the electrical impulse passes and the action potential ends. A stimulus that is adequate enough in both strength and duration is called an adequate stimulus. Adequate stimulus will reduce the negativity of the cell to the threshold of the action potential, therefore beginning the first phase of action potential. Action potential behaves upon the all or nothing rule. This means Sub-threshold stimulus does not cause an action potential. On the other hand, supra-threshold stimulus produces an action potential that is more intense than the threshold stimulus, resulting in more frequent signals. When the excitable tissue reaches the threshold potential, depolarization takes place. In depolarization, the rapid sodium influx due to the opening of voltage-gated sodium channels will increase the positivity inside the cell, and the potential will reach the electrochemical equilibrium for sodium, which is known as the overshoot phase. It is slow at first, then it becomes rapid. Repolarization and after hyperpolarization are the phases where the cell membrane restores its resting membrane potential. After the sodium influx of the depolarization phase, the voltage-gated sodium channels will close, causing a decrease in sodium permeability, which is followed by a large potassium efflux through the voltage-gated potassium channels, decreasing the cell's electropositivity. The membrane potential increases slightly above the resting value due to the voltage-gated potassium channels not closing immediately when the membrane returns to its normal resting potential. This is known as the after hyperpolarization phase, also more commonly referred to as an action potential's undershoot phase. Sodium potassium pumps bring the membrane potential back to its resting value. This process is rapid at first, then it becomes slow. In action potential, there is a positive feedback loop represented as the sodium influx in the depolarization phase. 
when the cell membrane responds to the threshold stimulus by activating its voltage-gated sodium channels, increasing sodium entry into the cell. It results in the depolarization of the cell membrane. When sodium ions enter the cell, they change the membrane's polarity, which stimulates more voltage-gated sodium channels to open, which in return causes sodium influx therefore reinforcing the positive feedback loop. Local anesthetics interfere with action potential by inhibition of the postsynaptic receptors in the excitable tissues, which results in the inactivation of the voltage-gated sodium channels, blocking the flow of sodium ions through them, thus nullifying the action potentials. In other words, anesthetics bind with receptors that stimulate fast synaptic inhibition through chlorine ion influx, which hyperparalyzes the neuron, in other words, increasing the negativity inside of it. This leads to the prevention of depolarization of the neuron by any excitatory input. Positive feedback is an infrequent, non-homeostatic mechanism that functions in the same direction of the stimulus, amplifying the signal. It's a vicious loop that is stopped only by external stimuli. Action potential is the change in resting membrane potential of excitable tissues. It starts when a stimulus is strong enough to generate a signal. When this happens, depolarization occurs. It's characterized by a rapid sodium influx that starts a positive feedback loop. Repolarization occurs after the depolarization phase ends. The potassium efflux in this phase works to restore the resting membrane potential of the tissue. The potassium voltage-gated channels don't close immediately after reaching the resting membrane potential, causing the after hyperpolarization phase. This phase is bypassed by the sodium-potassium pump. Anesthetics work on inhibiting action potential by preventing the depolarization of the cell. This prevents signal transduction in the administered area, which reduces the sensation in it. Our body is a network of complex and minute structures. Sometimes it is necessary to take a step back and look at how magnificently pinpoint it is. But why don't excitable tissues respond to inadequate stimuli? Why don't you scout it out for yourself and find out? We would like to thank you for making it this far with us. And a special thank you to Dr. Noha Noh Lashin, Associate Professor of Physiology.